Welcome everybody for joining today for another uh, observatory webinar uh, with Universal Health Coverage Day 22 coming up, actually this 12th December. Uh, this webinar will focus on access to dental care, trends in service provision and reforming dental care coverage in Europe. Uh, my name is uh, Ewart van Ginneken of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, and I will be moderating today's webinar together with my colleague uh, Erica Richardson, who is also in charge of the chat and who you will hear from in a minute. Um, across Europe, oral health diseases are a major disease burden affecting almost half of the European population. However, limited coverage of dental care remains a major barrier for equal and affordable access to oral health care services. This results in financial hardship, but also unmet needs for poorer households. To improve um, financial protection for oral health, countries need to increase service and cost coverage, but how? And this is what we'll be talking about today. So some of the questions we'll be um, talking about are, what are the recent dental care coverage reforms in Europe? What can we learn from other countries to improve financial protection for oral health? But also, what are the arguments to increase uh, coverage? We have a very packed program today. Uh, first of all, my observatory colleague, Juliana Winkelmann, will provide the keynote and draw extensively from our oral health study, which she led on and which was published earlier this year. We then have two country spotlights. First, we will hear from Una McAuliffe, who will talk about Irish reforms. Una is a dentist and a Sphere PhD scholar based in the University College Cork. And her research focuses, among others, on dental policies and the oral health of children and cost. And then we will move uh, to Wilf Wil Williams, who will talk about refer reforms in the English NHS. Uh, Wilf is a policy consultant and a senior visiting fellow at the Nuffield Trust. Wilf is a health economist with experience in commissioning provider and policy roles and has worked across primary, community, acute and mental health sectors. Then we have actually two more spotlights. Um, Paula Fazalo will provide a spotlight from the provider perspective with a focus on prevention. Uh, Paula has been a practicing dentist since 1993 and is a lecturer in public health and preventive and community dentistry at the University of Malta. She is very active in all kinds of international organizations and she's currently the president, vice president of the European Association of Dental Public Health. Uh, finally, we will hear from Stefan Listel, and he will make the case for oral health. Stefan is a dentist and an economist and a full professor in quality and safety of oral health care at Radboud University and a director of translational health economics at Heidelberg University. Uh, before we go to Juliana, however, we will first go to Erika, who has a poll for us. Erika. Um, here's the poll. Um, just a little bit to find out where we are as, a, as an audience. Uh, first question is, is access to oral health care becoming an increasingly important policy area in your country? So is it a political priority? Um, but the second choice is, should oral health care be included in the statutory benefit basket? Um, so yeah, please do uh, give us some feedback. Uh, let us know uh, what you think. And um, back to you in, I want to say in the studio, Eva, but you're not, you're, you're, you're at home. So Eva, so, so back to you. <laughs> Feels like a studio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll hear the polls after we hear from Juliana. Okay. So Juliana, up, over to you now. So welcome everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Eva. Um, as um, you mentioned, I will present um, the oral health care in Europe, um, our health system review, which we published in summer this year and which has the product focus on financing as access and provision of oral health care. Um, so um, this, this oral health care is actually the first um, cross-country um, review on oral health care in Europe covering 31, age, uh, 31 European countries. And it uh, tries to show based on international data, the major trends, both in um, oral health status, but ma mainly in financing oral health care, the coverage, in the different European countries in regard to oral health care and access and, and the provision, so workforce and, and different types of provision settings, skill mix, etc. So it's um 
it's 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 a topical um, health and transition review, which um, which we, we, the European Observatory mostly looks at at country health systems, but this one is a cross country health system with different uh, focuses. So you, I invite you to consult it and and have a look in, into it. And um, the the advantage of this of this um, hit or first cross country comparison in Europe that it also provides a country specific description of oral healthcare systems, how countries design their, their the coverage systems. It pr proposes a classification of oral healthcare systems and highlights a number of topics um, which are relevant for dental care, like cross-border dental care, uh, corporate dentistry, et cetera. And it also ultimately, it also lists a number of our healthcare indicators, which should be included, which we recommend to be included in, in, in international data health collection. So just to give you an idea how the HIT is structured, as I said, um, financing ex coverage and access is the main focus. So I just pre give you a brief overview and um, highlight some, some issues. In regard to oral health status, um, we can see that um, oral health is a central component of oral health and psychological um, and well-being, and that most oral health um, more, or most oral disorders, disorders are uh, preventable and can be treated or can be treated at a very early stage, uh, like caries, gum disease, or oral cancer. However, um, the uh, oral diseases are um, the most prevalent health conditions in Europe. About 52% of the European population suffer from oral diseases. And the main oral diseases, as you can see, are caries, periodontal diseases, and endotelism. And, um, and, and the main risk factors, um, for all diseases are the same as for mo most non-communicable diseases like um, diet, diet, smoking, alcohol use, but also oral hygiene, of course. And when we have looked at the data uh, on oral health status, we, we um, could, could um, see that cross-country comparison is some, sometimes very difficult because there is a lack of harmonized and standardized collection of oral health data. As said, um, we looked at the financing part of our healthcare, and we can see that um, the overall expenditure per capita on our health um, increased in most countries from in the time span from 2008 to 2019, um, uh, which is mostly due to the increase of private the private part of our healthcare spending. Um, and um, in total, there is um, the public spending is much less. Um, important for oral health care compared to other oral disease, other health healthcare areas uh, public spending accounts for about 30 percent of total dental care spending um so as i said fun, um, private spending accounts for um most of dental care spending uh, about for for about 60 percent public the public spending accounts for 31 percent um and then we can see that there's, there's a large variation across country but when it comes to um the share of old, uh, private uh, spending and public spending. And we can see that a number of countries, um, um, voluntary health insurance play a very important role when it comes to the financing of oral health care. Um, as I said, um, the public coverage is generally lower for all health care compared to um, a number of other um, health care areas like inpatient care um, or long-term care. So, uh, so uh, dental care accounts for about 40% uh, of all out-of-pocket spending for overall health. Um, and um, of course, pharmaceuticals st still take uh, the largest part of private spending, but dental care is clearly in some countries like Estonia and Iceland, it takes about a third of all private spending it goes on dental care. And as I said, we have proposed a certain um, sort of um, typology of our healthcare coverage, public or healthcare coverage, across Europe um, to show the, diver the different levels of coverage, both in terms of population groups and services covered and the, um, the cost sharing um, that is required in the different countries. And we, we propose a very simplistic um, type of um, classification. Um, countries, nine countries um, have limited coverage um, where um, all, almost all population groups are exempted um, from public coverage um, apart from vulnerable groups like children. And then we have um, 70 countries with partial coverage. Um, there, in these countries, children and adolescents are fully covered. Others are partially covered. And we have a number of countries, as, um, six countries um, with um, comprehensive coverage where a large benefit basket is covered and um, cost sharing only is about 25% for um, the majority of services. 
So this is just to give an idea of where countries are and where they could actually move if they want to extend coverage. And um, within the country specific um, description, um, you can also see um, how countries designed their um, benefit baskets and coverage system. So um, the, the, the um, benefit basket and public coverage actually also, as mentioned, uh, Evot mentioned, this, uh, determines, of course, how people have access to dental care and is translated in the um, reported unmet needs for uh, for healthcare. And in this figure, unmet needs for dental care is compared to medical unmet needs for medical care and prescription drugs. And we can see that um, unmet needs for dental care is in most countries um, much higher than the other types of care. And people do forgo for, for, go for uh, to for dental care due to financial reasons. Um, just to um, finish my presentations, I um, want to show how um, there, there are some countries in Europe that are aiming to extend the coverage, the public coverage for dental care. Um, there are amb amb ambitious plans they have, and I think the most for um, we have to mention. I mean, the most important um, country that has made important. Um, uh, reforms is France with the 100 Santé scheme introduced in 2000, um, and it's uh, the aim is um, to have half of the dental spending fully covered by either by public um, systems or volunteer health insurance, and have have to have no out of pocket spending for a range of um, dental services. So they have uh, actually regulated the prices for um, a number of uh, prothesis um, and included it in public uh, coverage. Um, so they have certain three different schemes um, according to the um, to the um, standard um, of, of care and treatment available. And this is an important reform, and we need still need to see the effect on unmet need of this reform in the next um, in the next surveys and the next data collection. Uh, another country, Eastern European country, is Estonia. It has extended and included actually the adults again in their um, public coverage system. Uh, with a 50% insurance co-insurance rate and the benefits being kept at 40 uh, euro per year and this year it has extended um, the eligibility of the highest benefit scheme for other for unemployed people etc so there's um there is um we can see some, pro some progress in in regard to extending um, um coverage though people, countries start from very different starting points and and go very different tra trajectories depending on their design of, of the coverage system and last but not least i want to mention portugal it has um in place in the national program for promotion of oral health um since 2016 with the objective to guarantee the availability of public dental care services in all regions and this is trying to do uh, ex provide access to um, oral health through the primary health care center and it has already um, a dentist providing care public oral health care in 47 out of 55 primary health care centers so, and with this um, overview, I want to you know, um, hand over to the next, uh, to the spotlight speakers who go in pan some country examples. No, first we will uh, have the poll. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Juliana. Um, I think uh, I can already see lots of discussion going on about uh, the classification uh, that we use in the book. I think everybody should download it and then also read there specifically for your country what kinds of uh, deliberations went into classifying, but it's of course not an easy, easy task to do. But uh, over to you, uh, Erica, uh, for the results of the poll. Thank you. So perhaps unsurprisingly, given that everyone's come to this particular webinar, um, yes, most people do think that oral health care should be included in the statutory benefit basket. But interestingly, sort of about um, an eighth of the people in the audience have said maybe which I mean is interesting because yeah we need to look at what coverage really means and what the uh, package of benefits would actually mean so uh, we'll come to that later in the discussion I'm sure um, but also uh, in three quarters of uh, respondents have said that all access to oral health care is becoming an increasingly important policy area in their country and we have a lot of countries represented so thank you very much welcome everybody Keep, do, do keep putting your comments and questions in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. So now we will be going to uh, the spotlights from the countries. Uh, Una, 
Thanks to Erica, Julianne and everybody at the Observatory for inviting me to participate today. The publication of the first ever Oral Health Systems in Transition Review is such an important milestone in highlighting the common oral health challenges across Europe. And despite being largely preventable, oral diseases remain some of the most prevalent conditions globally, let statutory coverage of dental care is restricted across many European countries with limited packages of coverage and high private expenditure. Ireland is one such country, and I will present a brief uh, overview of the Irish dental system, proposed dental system reforms, and what may be learned from the Irish experience. So the oral health care system in Ireland is complex, with a public-private mix of service provision. There are three publicly funded dental schemes in Ireland. State-funded dental care for children and special needs populations is delivered by salary dentists directly employed by the state. And aside from emergency care, access is determined by age rather than need, with a full course of treatment only provided at particular age groups, while just 5% of service activity is allocated to special needs groups. Access to the service varies extensively throughout the country, initially due to resource limitations and staff shortages, which have now been further compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic and personal redeployment. Dental services for adults are provided via two schemes, where private dentists are contracted by the state to provide care. The first scheme provides oral care for medical card holders, and about one third of the Irish population have medical cards due to their low income. Coverage is limited to an annual examination, two fillings and unlimited dental extractions. In April 2022, this coverage was expanded with an increase in fees. The number of private dentists, however, participating in the scheme has fallen in recent years, with an almost 25% decrease in service since 2020. Finally, we have a social insurance scheme, which provides cover for adults who have paid three-year social insurance contribution. So dental benefits are available to insured workers, the self-employed, retired people, and those who have the required number of benefits. So what we can see is that a significant proportion of the Irish population do not get access for any scheme and must pay out of pocket for private dental care. Well, now, contra- you, yes. Sorry, can you go a little bit slower? I think sure, some sure. people have trouble uh, following you. Just sure. you can take it down a notch. It's fine. Uh, so a significant proportion of the population do not get access for any scheme and they must pay out of pocket for private dental care. In contrast to the Irish general system, it's estimated that at least two thirds of all dental expenditure here in Ireland is privately financed, the majority of which relates to direct out of pocket payments. So there are gaps in coverage for large sectors of the population, including marginalised and vulnerable groups, the very young, adolescents, the elderly, and those with disabilities or in long term residential care. So following a decade of economic prosperity, Ireland experienced one of the most severe financial crises of any OECD country between 2008 and 2014. Both adult dental schemes are among the first health budgets to be cut. For example, public funding of the low-income adult scheme was cut from 62 to approximately 10 million being claimed annually between 2010 and 2015. And this resulted in unmet need for dental care tripling in Ireland between 2008 and 2012. We also know that the poorest were most impacted and that income inequality in unmet need is significant in Ireland, with the gap in unmet need in dental care growing between 2008 and 2012 and remained large even after unmet need began to fall. So Ireland's current oral health system is determined by a 1994 Dental Health Action Plan. In 2019, a new national oral health policy known as SMILE August Slointa, Slointa being the Irish for Health, was published. Its key goals are to support individuals to achieve their best oral health and to re- reduce inequalities, while the fluoridation of piped water supplies is supported. The oral health policy aims to align with the proposed universal general health policy, Slointa Care. However, the provision of care will be delivered at uh, various ages. The policy was published three years ago with implementation anticipated through to 2026. However, progress has been slow, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and declining dentist participation in publicly funded schemes. So we can see that oral health has not been a political or, or policy priority in Ireland. And despite the Irish economy experiencing exponential growth during periods, there was a failure to expand coverage for dental care. The number of dentists contracted to provide care is declining, resulting in a considerable barrier for patients to access care. Successful reform of this system will require greater political interest and strong leadership to unite the policy community and positive engagement with oral health professionals. The WHOA Resolution on Health and the Global Oral Health Status Report call for the inclusion of oral health under UHC. 
Ireland, like many countries, recognised oral health as essential health care during the COVID-19 pandemic, suggesting its inclusion into broader health systems. There has been a recent budgetary allocation for policy implementation for very young children and the continuing impetus for the inclusion of oral health within UHC internationally, for which there is agreed and agreed political consensus in Ireland could provide a platform for a greater oral health policy implementation and political support. Thank you again for inviting me to attend today and severe thanks to my uh, supervisor team and my funders. My contact details are on screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Una. Also really nicely showing the challenges uh, involved in uh, extending coverage, considering all the many crises that we're also currently facing. I think that will be a question for the debate afterwards. But now I would love to hear from, from the UK or from the English NHS. Wilf, over to you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so um, busy slide here, which I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to read, but I'll, I'll talk to the main points there. So there is, and I, I'm talking about England here, picking up the points that there are some differences now with the devolved administrations in the UK. There is a universal offer um, through the NHS, but um, for many, many years, um, Dental care has not been free at the point of use, as are many other services, although there are um, uh, patient charges for most groups, but um, some targeted groups uh, do are eligible for free care. So about 30 percent of people don't pay for their their net for their for their care. Big issue uh, at the moment, and this is something that, that, that comes around um, every so often, challenges in access to public care, particularly for new patients, those wishing to, to engage with the practice for the first time. And those issues were exacerbated by the COVID backlog. This is all, I mean, I, and, and this the provision issue, I suppose, for public patients uh, is really part of the continued shift that's been happening since the early 90s towards private provision. Um, that happened after a major contract change and another uh, another step change after further contract changes in the early 2000s. So there, there is a history of, of major contract reform, um, which is aiming to address issues, almost exacerbating those because of that drift to the private sector. Some recent changes um, which uh, have been introduced, um, um, the first changes since 2006 to address some of those immediate access challenges. But I think one of the concerns um, at the moment is that, you know, we, we saw in 2021 the abandonment of um, a move towards preventive and capitation based arrangements, which many in the in the oral health field would see as being um, advantageous in the direction in which we should be moving. Um, but we really are seeing very serious issues in terms of access at the moment, significant regional and sub-regional variation, and a lot of those relate to workforce issues um, where in, in areas which are less attractive for a variety of reasons for um, dental professionals to work in. So we're seeing the phenomenon of dental deserts, um, which we also saw happening uh, in the early 2000s. Um, whilst there is good um, you know, universal coverage, we do see the inverse care law very much in evidence in dentistry, uh, as in many other areas, and we see persistent inequalities in access and oral health status. So we have a we have a universal offer, but those that we would most want to take that up are not always those who are coming forward, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Whilst the the the, the, the there's been no cha formal changes in cover. Um, uh, in real terms, expenditure on dentistry is declining and patient charges have increased ahead of inflation. So, I mean, that really gives a sense that this is not an area of, uh, hasn't been an area of significant political concern over the years. Political um, focus tends to come when there are front page headlines in terms of access, uh, and that's um, unfortunate. Um, but, but I think there is a general sense that we need to be moving towards a, a, a different different model, much more focused on prevention and probably, probably in many people's minds, supporting capitation arrangements um, to uh, encourage um, uh, optimal um, oral health care. We have workforce pressures, but the data on workforce is, is poor. We know a number of registrants, but we don't know a great deal about what, what where those people work and what they do. There are, again, exacerbating problems in terms of access is, uh, for a variety of reasons, general reported dissatisfaction with NHS working arrangements uh, amongst dental professional groups. There are big opportunities of other, as of, as of, of flagged in terms of skill mix, um, significant opportunities for a broader um, dental care professional workforce. 
but presently reimbursement and practice organization uh, organizational arrangements are not particularly supportive of moving in that direction so we have a universal offer but because of um, workforce issues and, and a move towards the private sector, we have significant capacity issues in delivering, uh, delivering care. And um, whilst there is aspiration to move much more, much more towards preventative um, uh, approaches, um, we are struggling to actually make that translation in practice with a political focus very much on activity and access rather than moving towards that, um, that aspirational goal. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wolf. Um, also really showing the provider uh, challenges and, and the numbers of, of workforce. I think something that only uh, got more difficult during the pandemic and also is one of the areas where unmet need, as we said before, was high, but became even higher. Um, you also talked about uh, preventive care and uh, well, that's actually what Paula is going to talk about. So Paula, over to you. So good afternoon. Um, as we have heard from our colleagues, um, there is a lot of challenges in unmet needs in many countries. We've heard a lot in the past, when we thought of dentistry in the past, this has clearly been seen as a luxury service, which is treatment focused. But we know that this is not the case. We know that oral health is an integral part of general health and that we need oral health for our quality of life, for our well-being, for healthy, active aging, and that we cannot have general health without oral health. So why aren't our systems focused on prevention? We know a lot of the services which are available are treatment focused. And I can give an example, even from my own private practice experience, where sometimes when patients even come to my clinic and they, I focus a lot on prevention, they sometimes are not even willing to pay for preventive advice. So there is a lot of work which needs to be done also for us at the policy level, at the health system level, at an education level, for us to be reorient our services to be patient-based, prevention-based, and how can we start? I think the first thing we can start is with our education systems, ensuring that um, we train not only dentists, dental hygienists, we focus on all the members of the dental team and give them also training in prevention in public health so that they can be also the future advocates of oral health. It's also important that we look at our payment models and we need to have payment models which also focus on preventive dentistry and prioritize prevention instead of treatment. And this can be done through offering fluoride varnishes in children, um, preventive services, ensuring that there is access to these preventive services for all. Other aspects we can focus on is also having uh, preventive programs available in the wider community. We have evidence of school brushing programs which do work to focus on prevention, but we definitely need to focus on shifting our services to one which is very much focused on a preventive model. We also need that prevention and public health is integrated in all policies. Not only should it be integrated in health policies, but in general, in all um, policies and strategies across the board. So in summarizing my focus, we need to focus three main take home messages. That one, we start with our university education. Let us ensure that we have training for all members of the dental team. The training includes a focus very much on public health and prevention, that we look at our payment models to ensure that there is a priority for payment for prevention, and also looking at 
continuously educating our members of the team with a focus on prevention and also advocating with policymakers that oral health is a basic right, a basic need. And since we know that dental diseases can easily be prevented, let us make sure that oral health is a priority and that access to oral health preventive services are given the priority that they do deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. You convinced me that this is the way to go. Um, let's now go over to um, Stefan. Um, the floor is yours. So this spotlight is more like a zoom out now. Um, so just uh, <laughs> raising the question of like oral health, why bother? Um, so for folks who are not like uh, in the oral health world or working in the oral health world uh, routinely, um, just to reiterate, um, yeah, more than half the European population suffers from uh, caries, peritonitis, tooth loss, and oral cancer. Uh, and that means that oral diseases are the most prevalent group of health conditions. Um, this is also mentioned in, in, in Juliana Ewald's and uh, co-author's report, I mean, uh, which I really uh, find fantastic, strong recommendation. Please really read it carefully. Um, like despite like this large and persistent burden, it's also important uh, to, to highlight uh, what we spend in European countries on, on dental care. And as you see in this, this graphic here, um, dental diseases rank third uh, behind diabetes and cardiovascular diseases in terms of, we, uh, of what we spend on them uh, for, for treatment. So this means there are substantial treatment expenditures uh, ranking among the three most uh, expensive diseases. Uh, and uh, despite that, we see a persistently large burden affecting more, more than half of the European population. So I think this is already raising some, 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 some issues and, and some, some tension in terms of asking questions like, you know, uh, what do we spend uh, devil expenditures on? And like, do we really get the best uh, return in terms of oral health outcomes back to what we invest in? Uh, treatment, and uh, I think I think these this is raising challenges really. Um, I think it's worthwhile to to point out that uh, our health has enormous social and economic relevance. Um, as I saw in the chat, like some people were commenting that there is evidence and increasing evidence for relationships between oral health and general health. I think the, the, the strongest evidence existing so far is for uh, relationships with diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, there's also some recent evidence on the impacts of tooth loss on depression. So that's a dimension of mental health. Um, it's also um, related to quality of life. Um, in addition, we know that oral health has a relevant role for educational attainment. So people uh, and children, adolescents uh, with dental pain uh, lose time in school, which then has implications for their uh, achievements in school. In the labor market, that means if people um, you know, miss working days, this has implications for productivity and also their income. Uh, as we know, oral health is uh, really crucial for social participation, uh, people struggling with speaking and socializing, uh, you know, they are uh, really facing challenges in society. And as I just highlighted, there's also like a substantial treatment cost component. Um, all of which just trying to highlight that there's really an enormous social and economic relevance of, of oral health. And I think the big, big question to ask is like, uh, where do we go from here? How to move forward? Uh, I would argue there's a strong role for uh, more comprehensive citizen engagement to help achieve universal health coverage. Uh, and uh, any change is always a, a struggle and is, is complex. So I would uh, argue along the lines of evidence and form deliberative processes, which sounds uh, maybe more complex than saying, these are iterative cycles of improvement. There's this notion of learning oral health systems. And uh, the idea there is it's just like a, a iterative process in which there's a constant reconsideration of what are our prior priorities? So where should we invest in oral health care? Um, this should be based on the best available evidence. Uh, we, 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 I think we really need to learn better how we translate knowledge into concrete policy recommendations and implementing them. And all of that means like this needs to be done together, involving all relevant stakeholders involved in your health field. With that, I'll, I'll uh, stop here. 
and bring it back to Ewald and uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Stefan. I really like also how you say that we need to involve the citizens better, and that will probably be a question for you later. How do we actually do that? Uh, but before we do that, uh, I would like to ask everybody to switch their cameras on the whole panel. And also, I will want to start with Erica, because she was monitoring the chat, which was very active. I couldn't keep up, so I <laughs> hope that you managed. Um, maybe you can give us a, the questions. Okay, I'm going to just start with a couple of questions. Um, uh, but I have plenty of questions. So um, one of the um, issues around workforce um, and training and supply needs. Are there any examples of good practice that came up maybe in the oral health hit? Um, and this sort of like wider European experience, you know, addressing shortages and how much shortages are an, uh, one of the access barriers. Um, and also involving allied professionals and how to get them into oral health plans and things like this. Um, so workforce, a big issue, but also general issues around coverage. So what do we really mean by coverage in, you know, what do we mean by comprehensive coverage, partial coverage, limited coverage, but also what, where should the limits be on coverage, particularly with regard to the package of benefits? So um, that what it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and yeah, and he, and sort of, is it is it enough to have a policy, or is implementation also part of the issue? So, back to you, um, Eva, and I'll uh, come back with more in a bit. Okay, so maybe we can start with you, Juliana. Uh, there were questions uh, about workforce good practice. Maybe you have an example. Uh, I've seen some. I mean, it's a challenge basically everywhere. Uh, I think probably even got worse during COVID, but. Um, do you have examples? Uh, well, first of all, I think um, what is important when we talk about health workforce and especially dentists, there is we do not have very good quality data because many um, countries differ in terms of how they count the red, uh, dentists. So some um, don't have uh, registries, etc. So we do, we have we have used a data which is coming from the Council of European Dentists, but. Um, they are not really reliable and even more the, uh, the data on dental hygienists, dental nurses, dental technicians, which play in some countries a really important role. So uh, Germany, Denmark, they have a high share of dental nurses um, and which also uh, provide services, but mostly assist um, the dentist. But we have seen in that in the, looking into some country examples that, um, for example, Denmark, Netherlands, UK, um, the, the dental hygienists and dental technicians really play an important role and they can provide care without um, having need, need, need of refer. Like in the, in the Netherlands, about 90% of the dentists actually refer directly to a dental hygienist and the di di a dental hygienist, they can carry out scaling, root planning and other some um, small treatments, which is not, um, which I think these are good examples uh, that other countries can learn from. Um, and then there is, um, I think, the trend to 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 more skill mix in terms of um, uh, regarding the lack of dentists in, in a number of countries that um, more that some tasks are um, uh, shifted to other professionals um, because they can they are able to deal with um, um, these um, certain services much better and at a low, lower cost than than dentists. Should I also go to the so the coverage? Um, Part or you let's, let's wait with the coverage question once maybe perhaps uh, I mean I saw um, Paula also nodding uh, yes and because you were talking about prevention maybe you want to talk a little bit about who those people should be it doesn't need to be that it's only dentists looking into uh, a mouth of a child or, or, or anybody so what are the some of the innovations that you see no, I think I think they should be looking at it from two perspectives, that the dental team have a role in actually preventing all non-communicable diseases and not only oral diseases, because we have the opportunity of seeing um, people who, are, who don't really visit medical practitioners, but also we have all the other health workforce who have a role to play in the prevention of other diseases. So I would see that there needs to be a lot of um, integration uh, of the services, but also at an education level where other health is also included into other health professionals modules. 
Yeah, maybe, uh, Will, if you want to come in on that one, I think you were also talking about this, some skill mix innovation on your slide. Maybe you want to add a, a few words on this. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's huge opportunity here, um, but I think it's something that we need to really, um, you know, plan and support the implementation. Because one of the things I think uh, someone spoke about earlier on was what, oral health seems to be very separate from everything else. Um, so it, it's, it's not integrated in that way, and we really need to build on that. I think that also what that means is that a lot of the things that we do in oral health don't get the sort of level of change management and implementation support that we would see in other aspects of healthcare. I mean, major contract change in, in Britain was really just sort of here it is, get on with it. We wouldn't do that sort of major change if it was inside a big health organization. So I think there's something about how we work with dental professionals to help them through these change processes as well, because um, part of part of the working with a different skill mix is changing mindset and awareness. And I don't think there's enough attention to that to, to, to support people to move in that positive direction. Maybe Una, you want to add? Well, I think referencing, uh, you know, implementation and with mentioning implementation and change. Um, and I saw a, a kind of similar question in the chat. For Ireland, we have had a new national oral health policy, um, but our system is still directed by a 1994 action plan or legislation stems from 1985. Um, you know, we're waiting on an implementation strategy, although uh, in, in a positive note, we have had uh, signs of recent budgetary allocation towards children's services, but it's the importance of trying to integrate oral health and main, making sure that oral health has a seat at the table uh, in terms of the overall health system and keeping oral health uh, on the agenda of uh, powerful actors. So powerful, you know, in terms of political interest, uh, and that's a responsibility for oral health advocates, for dentists and for educators, for all of the stakeholders, you know, to make sure that policy publication actually translates into effective implementation. Um, maybe we can move now to the to the question that was asked about coverage, and perhaps I can go to you, uh, Stefan. But maybe you also want to come back to the previous point. I think you put your hand up, but maybe otherwise you can talk about what constitutes good coverage. What should it be? What should it include? Are there things that we shouldn't include? What are your thoughts or your you know? Yeah, I was just about to comment still on, on the workforce issue, but I think like they all are interdependent. Like it's not yeah. like you know you can you, you, we can consider coverage independent of the workforce discussion because they all have implications for resource use. I would argue. Uh, the point I wanted to make in relation to to, to workforce uh, issues was mainly to highlight. I think like the. Yeah, like a smart way to go would be to prioritize in the first place, like, uh, you know, what are people's actual oral health needs? And I don't think we fully understand what citizens' uh, preferences and actual essential needs really are. So, like, I think there would be a strong role for, for that dialogue and then taking that as a basis for defining, like, what's the type of essential or oral care that's needed? And that should then define like who can provide that care, like in which role, like what uh, combination uh, of uh, of different uh, uh, providers and uh, different uh, uh, yeah interventions can be combined together in, in, in an efficient and equitable package of care. Uh, and then that directly links to the, to the question on coverage. Um, and for the coverage discussion, again, I think like uh, it's important to uh, start with better understanding what people's essential needs for care are and trying to model coverage packages around it. Um, and um, yeah, of course, like in, in, in that discussion, then there's also the financing uh, debate, which comes into play. You know, we realistically need to look at what's available in terms of resources. And that's always, uh, you know, the, the challenge we face in every area of healthcare and also in, in, in outside healthcare. But I think there's really a strong role for citizens in that debate and understanding better what their needs and preferences are and uh, take that as a basis for dialogues. Is it also that we need to make a much better case, you know, how cost effective investing in dental health would be? And even if there are no funds allocated, they should definitely be looking at it because it's it pays itself off. Um, if that's a question to me, I would uh, definitely say yes. Um, I think like the um, yeah, the, one of the limitations we've been having in the past is that very often the outcome measures considered in the oral health field are like oral health specific, but not making the translation towards the uh, more general health implications or quality of life or mm -hmm. dolly discussion. Like this is only like a relatively recent 
development, I think, but we need more of that and also like be more explicit about what's the actual implications of uh, of, of our health care on uh, general well-being and general health outcomes. Okay. Um, Juliana, would you like to come in on the on the coverage question? There were quite a lot of questions, I think, where people were wondering why their country was classified by us as partial. Um, maybe you want to you wanna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, maybe just to get back to why is uh, oral health care not considered um, or is not mostly covered um, in many countries. It's the main reasons we think is because it's very um, ex perceived as very expensive because it's, uh, due, due to the fact it's treatment oriented and often it's considered to be a personal responsibility to keep your mouth, mouth uh, healthy, to, to, to eat healthy di diet, etc. So this is, I think, uh, the misconception, though it is, should be considered as essential health care. Um, in regard to um, the coverage question, um, where should the limits of coverage be and why are um, countries clustered in partial coverage? Um, well, we have um, we have defined very um, broad categories um, because we had to make um, to make, had to make decisions and um, we came up with uh, three three categories um, and um, so uh, and and and. So, so the countries which have which have comprehensive coverage, they have very short, low, low cost sharing, even for adults. And um, many countries have much higher um, cost sharing for the ma ma majority of the population, which goes beyond 25 percent of the cost of uh, most services, dental care services. And this is due to the design of the benefit package and the cost sharing um, um, that um, most uh, countries ask um, uh, or ask patients to to actually co-pay. Um, and um, I'll, the question, where should the limit, limit be? I mean, this is not an easy question. It's it certainly um, comes into the financial constraints of countries, etc. And But I think a good starting point for countries is really to look what have other kind of, what is the design of other countries and where do they are fair in terms of unmet needs, in terms of um, uh, population health um, or health outcomes. So to, to see which countries are doing well and then to adapt um, their systems to their financial possibilities and 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 the local systems of providers, et cetera. Okay. Um, maybe I'll come back to you, Erica. You've been monitoring the chat. I see quite some activity. Um... Yes, some activity. And um some I've got I've got a very provocative question, which I think I think needs to be asked. Um but uh, one of them is, um, how can we keep the focus on oral health as a historically neglected area, where as we face, you know, the perma crisis, as it's being, being become known, um, that's one of the areas which again, I suppose, is linked to making the case for or, for oral health. But also, there's been quite a lot of discussion about whether or not we need dentists. And whether or not oral health is a matter for the health system, or actually is this something, is, should we be looking instead at commercial determinants of health or looking at socioeconomic inequalities and addressing those as a priority rather than, you know, focusing downstream on sort of like oral health. So that's, that's quite a big, and I think for this setting quite a provocative question. But yes. Yeah, let's let's do a last round on these. Maybe uh, I'll go uh, to each and all of you and then you can decide which one you want to talk about or if there's any other thought. I think the question about how can we keep it on the agenda, but also what are what should we be doing? We as uh, as researchers, um, what should we be doing to to make the case better? So um, maybe we start with uh, with with Paula again. So just talking of the first point is that there is no health without oral health. And that the evidence is there. And it really is time for us to act now. And focusing on your challenging questions, yes, we need to look at upstream activities. We need to look at the social determinants, at commercial determinants, because by addressing these factors, we know we're going to, we can achieve health for all and oral health as part of general health. So definitely, and uh, we need to focus at the bigger underlying factors, looking at taking social determinants as one of the bigger priorities. Yeah, maybe Una, would you like to go? I'm going to echo Paula um, for 
you know, we need to focus upstream. We need to be shifting from the more traditional uh, restorative act based treatment model to more preventative methods and and that will need to start from education of uh, the dental team and and broadening the scope of uh, the dental team and other health professionals like hygienists Um, but you're going to always need active dentistry when when, uh, the disease develops Uh, it is it's it's a combination um, in terms of how to keep oral health uh, fighting for uh, attention with the rest of the health system um, as Juliana has highlighted the importance of good data and our role as researchers um, the need for evidence um, it's very difficult to advocate for the importance of oral health um, if we don't have evidence um, to to uh, you know illustrate uh, our points and I think that's it's very important outcome from the hit is just how critical uh, that that the, and how necessary it is to improve the oral health evidence that's available data. Yeah, thank you for making that point. That's exactly also what we noticed in the study on oral health, uh, although it's, of course, a problem that is wider than just oral health, but it would seem to be very uh, pressing and, and, and uh, there. Uh, Wilf, what are your thoughts? I think one of the great things about oral health is the, you know, the, the fact that we can prevent it. And I think we've also got a very good sense about where oral health need may may go over the next 10, 20, 30 years. So I think one of the key things we need to do is to define what the the workforce mix is for that longer term and really begin to move with purpose towards training the right mix of professionals and shifting that for the long term. I think the other thing in terms of any service that, that struggles for oxygen bandwidth attention is the more you can attach it and link it to other agendas the more likely it is to get ongoing attention so i think that link into um, um, broader um, and general health is a really important um, um, angle to pursue and i think also a greater integration uh, of oral health and dentistry within what systems do because i think so long as dentistry is sort of over here to the side there will be a tendency for it to be only picked up on when there is some sort of crisis. Take it out of the silo and into the health system. Better integration. No, it's it's a very obvious thing to say, yeah. but I think it, it needs to be done with purpose. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so maybe to you, Stefan. Um, what might also help is like making stronger economic arguments, like I guess, like in, in sense of investment cases. I, I, yeah. I sense that in, in the health policy circles. It's easy to, how do you say, to uh, not see oral health as a high priority because it's, uh, you know, like, frankly, it's not leading to many deaths and very often mortality is like a main argument being 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 made uh, to put priority to uh, different diseases. And I think it's also like a very long-term uh, disease process usually. So over time, like, uh, you know, the disease burden and the economic burdens come uh, after years and decades, like for, for society and then in, 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 in slow and in, in fast-paced policymaking uh, circles, I mean, uh, that, that can easily be, be pushed to the back. So like one, one phrase to use might be things like, if you think good or health is expensive, try in action. So, you know, like, do, do not act now, like, but you get the bill later, later on. So t- you, you get to pay much more if you ignore it in, in the short term. So like, I think and that's not made so clear to policymakers so far, I guess. So, yeah, that's what I would recommend, like yeah, starting to speak the policymakers language more explicitly and more clearly. Making Yeah. And, and um, I just saw also this question that related to that uh, here about whether there is any studies available on the cost effectiveness of preventive oral health care programs. Uh, you know, if anyone of you wants to say anything to, to that point, uh, we have a minute or two, and then uh, before we close out, I don't know, Stefan, you, maybe you want to add or Juliana? I mean, out of my head, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm not up to date with the most recent, recent evidence, but I think there is evidence out there which uh, you know, goes in the direction of uh, showing that prevention is uh, cost effective or cost efficient. Uh, I, I see the the, the the challenge, as as I tried to say before, is more that the outcomes used are mainly sort of like very disease specific or health outcomes. And then if you try to make your case in sort of like in broader health policy making, making circles, 
you struggle with convincing people because you cannot translate it into broader dimensions of health outcomes like quality of life years or dollies and so on. And I think there's a real need to, to change that and to look broader into the implications of oral health on general health. Okay. Um, then I think, Juliana, you had your hand up on this specific issue. Well, it's not on prevention, but to make the case why to keep uh, oral health on the agenda. I mean, we have seen the unmet needs and um, especially the, the um, experience of some countries which have, during the financial crisis, which have reduced the benefit basket or the benefits for all healthcare during these years and unmet needs um, responded, I mean, increased in the years after, I mean, not immediately, but so this is, I think, makes it, it and unmet needs is much higher than for other um, medical areas. So this makes actually the case, and we need to have uh, to show this argument and um, use this argument for for to keep our health on the agenda. Yeah, and that's why we're here, I think, and uh, we have our work cut out for us. Um, so, um, Juliana, I will give you the final concluding thoughts, as we always do with our uh, keynote speaker before I close uh, this uh, this webinar. So, Juliana. Yeah, please. just uh, briefly, thank you, uh, to brief up. And I think most of the really important points have been um, be stressed by all of us. Um, the, the importance of preventive care, the community involving more um, providers, community, um, other or um, other healthcare providers from um, pediatricians, um, um, but also um, long-term care professionals that have an eye on, on oral health status. and oral health status using as an indicative um, indicator for oral, other diseases like diabetes and other unwell. Um, if, pe then if people are unwell, um, then um, dentists or other, um, or, um, or other health professionals can see this. Um, and this also is, brings to the idea to integrate, better integrate oral health care um, into other service settings um, like long-term care and, and, and child care. Um, but I think to, to fa facilitate uh, this integration, incentives need to be set both for patients and for providers uh, in terms of financing, in terms of cost sharing incentives to really do uh, um, um, regular checkups. Um, and you, we all mentioned uh, the skill mix, um, use of skill mix, other uh, health professionals to provide uh, preventive services and uh, dental treatments. And I think what, uh, last but not least, what I would like to mention that the importance of having good data um, on oral health status, but also on payment um, on pay payment structures, where does how much private spending um, countries allocate for dental care or uh, and public spending um, allocate for dental, dental care. Um, and we do not have enough um, good evidence on the workforce in oral health care. So this, this are um, important area where we need um, more better data to inform policymaking. Thank you very much, uh, Juliana. Um, um, now, the only thing I have to do now is to, to thank uh, you, the presenters, uh, for, for your contributions, but also you, uh, the viewers today, who were uh, very active uh, in our chat and uh, had all these amazing questions for us. Um, uh, please have a look at our website. Uh, you can watch this one, this webinar back on YouTube eventually, but also the other ones that we've done. Um, and also uh, Thursday, you don't have to wait very long. On Thursday already, we have a new webinar coming up at 2 p.m. organized together with the European Health Forum in Gastein. How far have we come in strengthening health system resilience in Europe towards the European Health Union? So a very interesting topic, and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much for joining and see you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.